Willkommen zusammen. Heute Abend gibt es den Talk von Andrea über den Coronavirus Structural Task Force und ich bin Melzai, äh, der Herald für die Session. Ähm, wir haben einen Signal Angel hier, das heißt, der Signal Angel ähm, wird die Fragen sammeln, die ihr in den Chat stellt und dann gehen wir am Ende vom Vortrag über diese Fragen. So viel zum Ablauf. Ähm, der Vortrag wird ähm, aufgezeichnet ähm, und ist dann dementsprechend nachträglich verfügbar auf mediaccc.de irgendwann in den nächsten Tagen oder Wochen. Und damit würde ich mich freuen, Andrea, du als Nachwuchsgruppenleiterin an der Uni Hamburg, du hast dich die letzten zwei Jahre mit dem Coronavirus beschäftigt und daraus wunderbare Visualisierungen gemacht. Wie lief das denn ab und vor allem, wie sieht Corona eigentlich aus? Ja, vielen Dank. Erstmal danke für die Einladung. Und ja, genau darum geht es eigentlich in dem Talk jetzt. Ähm, um die, was wir die Coronavirus Structural Task Force nennen. Und ähm, I'm going to give the presentation in English so that international listeners can also listen in. Um, but you can ask your questions in, um, well, any language anyone here speaks. I understand German, English, and Japanese. And um, I want to start with a quote by Marie Curie. Um, I know the room Mary is not named after Marie Curie, but she said something that is very true in this pandemic, which is, Nothing in life is to be feared, only to be understood. Now is the time to understand more, so that we may fear less. And indeed, this holds true for the coronavirus more than anything, because as you all know, you cannot see the virus. You can only see it indirectly visualized by signs, or you can see the measures against it, or you can see ill people, but the virus itself is invisible. And I'm going to start this talk with questions. There will be many questions. And the first one is, what does the coronavirus look like? Now, you may think you know, but the reality of it is that even German news has no idea. And I know that ZDF is now using a different picture, which looks more similar to what I'm going to show, but it's very wrong as well. This picture is what most people think the virus looks like. And I also brought you like two top modern models of the virus. One can even make sounds. Any spiky ball these days really passes as a coronavirus because no one seems to know what the thing really looks like. Only it's like round and it has spikes. That's the only thing that all the models have in common. But some things look like you can just, you know, like they are little Shrek ears type things or have tentacles. No one really knows. So how do we know as scientists? And can viruses be seen? If we imagine, so this is an electron microscopic picture of a human hair. It's 0.1 millimeters is the length of this line. So the hair is a little bit less. The little red dot, which you may or may not be able to see inside that circle, is the size of the coronavirus. Now, if we zoom into the picture of the hair, you can see, I hope, a little red dot here. And that's the coronavirus to measure. So it is 150 nanometers or 0.0001.5 millimeters large. That is tiny, even by scientist standards. However, even smaller than the virus with 150 nanometers is a single atom, which is represented here again by a dot which is barely visible and is 0.1 nanometers in diameter or one angstrom. Atoms are tiny even compared to the virus. So the virus is composed, being matter, of very, very many atoms. How can we visualize something this small? Can we see it with a light microscope? And what color would the virus be? This is to scale yellow light. It is 600 nanometer wavelength, meaning from this point to this, it is 600 nanometers. So the wavelength of visible light, which ranges from 400 to 780 nanometers, is actually longer than the virus is wide. So there is no chance whatsoever ever observe a single virus with light. 
just physically not possible. We need something that has a smaller wavelength. And there are two things we use, X-rays, which have 0.1 nanometer wavelengths. So they are very, very small. They're like light, they're also photons. We call it also X-ray light, Röntgenstrahlung, Röntgenlicht. But they have so high energy that their wavelengths are tiny. The other thing are electrons, which have even smaller wavelengths if you choose to regard them not as particles, but as waves. So we can use electrons and X-rays to observe the virus, and we do. And for this, we have several possibilities. One of them is large particle accelerators, like the one I'm working on in Hamburg, which produces very intense X-rays. Another one is an electron microscope. So here is a model of an electron microscope. In order to use it, you need a scientist, and then you shoot an electron beam from an electron cannon. That's the official scientific term. It's an electron cannon onto, with an electron gun. Yeah, electron cannon, electron gun. You shoot your electrons through lenses, which are magnetic. Electrons are negatively charged, so a magnetic field can be used as a lens system onto a sample, so for example, the virus. And then you have a detector. What do we see on this detector if we shoot viruses? with electrons and record how many electrons pass through the sample. What we see looks like this. So of course it's black and white because electrons come, there's no colors involved. And what you can see is a dark shadow and then around it a little bit of brighter spots, almost like a corona during a um, sun eclipse. So this is why the coronavirus is called coronavirus, because its spikes under the electron microscope look like a corona. And these pictures have no colors, but scientists like to color them, in particular in order to tell people this is a dangerous virus and that is the background. So if we color it, it may look like this. And this is an official picture released very early um, in the pandemic by the National Institutes. Um, as one of the first pictures of the new coronavirus. We can also do scanning electron microscopy, which is a similar measure where you coat the entire surface and then you get a pretty three-dimensional picture. What you can see here are lung cells, the long carpet-like, the like hairy structure here, that's lung cells. They are signal type two alveolar epithelial cells. So they're like a little, like, like their job is to get rid of stuff the lungs don't want. They're like a carpet, they can like move and they get rid of stuff for you. However, these cells here have a problem. They're infected with coronavirus. You can see some slime or mucus here and um, you can see the viruses here. Because of the coating, they look a little bit like cauliflower. So that's nice, but it doesn't give us the full picture. But so much for people who say we cannot isolate the virus, we can actually even like make it visible. So we can make this invisible enemy visible. It is just a question of having the right equipment and a good sample of the virus and many hours of work. The virus therefore exists and can be made visible using electron microscopes or for example, also particle SLRHs, but I'm not gonna go into detail here. We have not enough time tonight. I'm only going to talk about electron microscopes here. So what is the virus made of? Um, this is the virus. Um, we're going to talk about this picture later in the talk when we talk about the model a little bit more. But here is one spike. I think you've all heard in news from spike proteins which cover the surface of the vi virus or better the virion. If we draw this schematically, as Thomas Spletschdöser did for us, um, he's an illustrator burst in Berlin, it looks like this. And then we take only the head of the spike, which is the region of the spike we know most about, and then comes an animation that I did, so it's not quite as pretty. If we zoom in, we see the surface, and below that surface, we see things represented as a ribbon. However, we can show this differently. We can show this as individual atoms connected to each other. The problem with this display is that it's really hard to find anything here. It is super difficult 
to get an overview with this picture. So we prefer to show these complicated and big molecules made up of atoms as surfaces and ribbons. And this ribbon diagram, by the way, has also been found by a great female scientist, Jane Richardson, um, several decades ago, which was quite revolutionary for my field. So the virus is made up of atoms and molecules, and their structures can be found out by NMR, X-ray crystallography, and electron microscopy. For now, this is all I'm going to tell you. We're now going to dive very deeply into the biology of the virus and what the structures tell us. And then in the end, I'm going to tell you a little bit more exactly how we actually get from the measurement to the model, which holds some pitfalls and problems for us and is a area in which I do usually my research. But first, I'm going to talk about the model. You all know this picture from the CDC, right? And by the way, this thing, for a scientist, this thing is not a virus. It's a very, uh, it's only the transport form of the virus. The virus does a few more things that are not like contained in this little shell. That's just the transport form for its RNA to get into a host cell. We call this a virion. But most people, even scientists, can also refer to it as the virus. So this is the CDC model, right? That's the picture that went all through the press around the world. That's like the picture of this pandemic. And it was made by the CDC very early on by two scientific illustrators there. However, already then it had some problems. They made it in quite a rush and it has some errors. So we decided to make a new picture which looks like this. And um, if you compare the two pictures, here are the differences. The head of the spike in this illustration sits directly into the surface, while in reality it is sit singing, sitting on a long, very bendy, um, like rope-like structure that tethers it. So the virus, the head of the spike, which binds to the host cell is quite flexible. Um, the surface is not quite as coarse as shown here. It's smaller. The virus is actually relatively large for a virus. And it's got other proteins swimming in its surface. If you look exactly, you'll see the virus is also not exactly round. Now, we thought this is not enough. It's nice to have a picture, but wouldn't it be nice if we could actually touch it? So we made a 3D printable model for those interested. You can find also all the information on our homepage. I'm going to show you the 3D model. Let's see. So this is the virus model. As you can see, the virus is not exactly round because it's outside is really very soft. It's like a soap bubble. It can change its shape quite drastically. It's wobbly and the spikes are actually stochastically distributed. They're not like regularly arranged and they are swimming in the skin. And there are other proteins in the surface as well, which you can perhaps see. Whether they really form this little flower shapes, we don't know. And the virus is huge. So this, on the same scale, one to one million, as a rhinovirus for the common cold. The coronavirus is huge. 20,000 base pairs RNA makes it one of the largest virus genomes we know. And the virus is therefore soft on the outside while rhinovirus has a very hard and rigid shell that is always composed the same. And we made this model in the hopes that like other scientists and perhaps schools would like to like print it at home and actually like get something tangible. And it turned out they did. So we get quite a few requests from people from childcare facilities and from schools and from other scientists. And even our administration liked to have them printed. One even proposed we may have them as Christmas ornaments, but I found that a little bit like tasteless, so we didn't do it. And like just before I left Hamburg, we got a new model. Um, this model is now already a year old. And in 2021, science made quite a lot of progress. So we now know there are fewer spikes and the virus all in all is a little bit smaller. So it's not quite like this, but perhaps less. So it's not 15 centimeters in diameter, the model is 12. Um, it is still like potato shaped, it's not round because now it was important for me to show. 
and I would have liked to show you this model like in front of the camera tonight, but it went into the museum. It was the first one we had, and we brought it to the opening of this exhibition in Hamburg, Pandemie Rückblicke in die Gegenwart. So you can now see it in the museum and it will be back in my office when they have assembled theirs. And um, this also holds true. I'm going to talk about the task force in the second half of this talk. But one thing that is really true and was true for this project as well is the task force is typically more interested in new communication project than in all the pile of stuff we need to finish. You may know this from home. Right, so this is our model. Now let's dive deeper into the thing, because so far we have only talked about the Virion and only about its outside. So the Virion has the spike proteins on the outside, two other proteins, M and E protein, it has a double membrane hull, which is very thin, a nucleocapsid, which is wrapping the RNA. The RNA is actually containing the genes for everything that the virus needs in order to like take possession of the host cell. So the RNA is the important bit the virion is transporting and the nucleocapsid and everything else kind of packs it and makes sure it gets into the host cell. And I'm going to show you quickly a video because I think this is so nice to understand. And it's the answer to the question, why does soap help against coronavirus? Because very many like other viruses are relatively hard to wash off, but not coronavirus because it's so large, it has only a double membrane shell. And this is a very nice video from the protein data bank from our colleagues there. So this is the virus double membrane, it has lipid molecules. You can see they are hydrophobic on the inside and hydrophilic on the outside. So they love water on the outside, but not the inside. Green molecules are soap. Soap also has a hydrophobic tail and a hydrophilic head. So unlike the water which stays outside, the soap just gets into the membrane and kind of like goes in between the lipids. And then they make holes so water molecules can get inside the virus. They can even assemble in around bits of the membrane and get it out of the virus hull or around a spike and remove the spike, which is hydrophobic at the stalk, out of the virus. This leads to a total decomposition of the membrane and therefore it can be completely dissolved by soap. As soon as the nucleocapsid and the RNA are exposed, the virus is no longer infectious. It needs its spike in order to infect. So you don't need to disinfect your hands. You can just wash them with soap, which I find is so lucky in this pandemic because you know, it would be really ugly if we would need to disinfect everything all the time, but we can actually just use soapy water. Although, let's be honest, I like to use disinfectant every here and then. It gives me just a feeling of more safety. It, it's kind of like a ritual to protect me. And I suspect several of you are the same. So, so much for the virion. That's like the outer shell. That's like the transport form. But there is more, much more. This is the coronavirus life cycle. Or I should be more correct, it should be called infection cycle because technically speaking, viruses are not alive. They need a host cell to reproduce. So I'm gonna come back to this picture. We're going to take this apart bit by bit. First of all, there is entry. Entry into, the, oh yeah, let's quickly go back. The thing at the bottom here, the big thing here, that's the host cell and the little one is the virus, right? We're clear on that. I hope we're clear, right? And this is the outside. So this is like your lung outside. That's your lung cell inside, or hopefully not your lung cell. Right. Here's the virus. And this is the spike. The spike is a vaccine target, as you know. It's what's encoded in RNA vaccines and is also contained in all the like vector vaccines we see. Um, and I brought you another model for that, which is also pictured here. So this is a 
one to 10 million scale model of the spike. And this is an antibody. Now, if you are vaccinated either by RNA or by vector vaccine, your body either produces or is injected with spikes, which are usually on something to carry it, a host cell or a, a cell of your body, if it's an RNA vaccine or a vector. Your body needs a few days to recognize this thing. So once it has, it will build antibodies that like perfectly fit onto that. They can recognize the spike very, very exactly. They have a specific binding site, which is much more rigid than anything else the antibody can bind to. Then this gets decomposed because the vaccine is not viable. What remains in your body is the information for these antibodies. So now if you get infected with corona, the immune system antibody recognizes the spike it has previously seen in the vaccine. And that is how the vaccine actually works. So having this protects you. One of the biggest problems with COVID-19 infections is that the immune system responds too late and then too much. So having these makes much more certain that you will not get severe COVID, which is, I think, very nice. And what we also did together with the animation lab in Utah is not only make this life, life cycle or infection cycle, we also made an animation, the scientifically most accurate animation available on how the virus actually binds onto the host cell. There's a lot we don't know, but everything we do know, we have shown here. So here is the virus. Um, you know the spike protein already. There's nucleocapsid inside. Um, there's the RNA, which encodes for the rest. We're going to go into the rest after this. And then at the bottom here is the host cell. So lung cells actually have ACE2 receptors shown in purple, and the spike protein recognizes those specifically, meaning the atoms, like a puzzle piece, fit exactly onto the purple receptors on the lung cells. Um, the spikes bind there, and then something else happens. Another enzyme also being in the membrane of the host cell cuts the spike. So it's not like it, the name spike suggests it would like shoot something into, but that's not the case. It gets cut. And then comes the bit where we are a little bit unclear how this happens. So what we know is after it's cut, it somehow ends being tethered into the host cell. And we don't know the mechanism of this. So we decided to illustrate it here with like a refolding process. And then it's energetically unstable. So in order to become more stable, the whole thing clamps and folds together, thereby dragging the virus and the host cell membrane together. The two membranes, two bilipidic membranes fuse. The virus material is inserted into the cell. The RNA is now inside the host cell. And this is how infection happens. So we felt it was particularly important to show this to people. We have made this animation creative comments, but unfortunately only American television caught up on it. So we're really hoping that one of the German like documentaries will show this because we think it's really nice to see this process like as accurately as we can depict it. So here's the spike, that's the role of the spike. Now, the nucleocapsid and the RNA have entered into the host cell. What happens now is that the nucleocapsid dissolves. How that exactly happens, we don't know, but it dissolves. And the RNA gets immediately translated into protein. So the genome gets read inside the cell because the cell believes it's RNA that comes from the host cell and it starts building the proteins encoded in it. Proteins are again molecules. And actually it makes one very, very long protein chain, really long, which is called the polyprotein, which then gets cleaved. So the scissors in this case, the thing that cleaves all the long protein chain into individual molecules that then actually can work, is called the main protease because it's cutting protein, it's called a protease. And these are the little triangle shaped things here. Only when that happens, 
do these bits become functional? So if it doesn't happen, if we can like hinder this like cutting of the long polypeptide chain, we have an efficient drug against corona, which is why main protease is a major drug target. And what you can see here in red is a drug actually bound to main protease. So that's what it looks like. Um, we are looking specifically for inhibitors which will stop this molecule from function. So you can imagine this like a screwdriver that we put at the right point in a machine in, where it fits and it stops the entire machinery. That's what we want. And that's like called structure-based drug design, when you actually know the structure of the molecule and then you find a molecule, a small molecule, a drug molecule that like specifically stops whatever that protein molecule is doing. It's also how many antibiotics work, or for example, if you've been up long yesterday, aspirin. Then from here, where we have the polyprotein thing, something happens inside the cell. The cell is making some kind of foam, which is connected to the endoplasmatic reticulum. That's this one. And inside it, these like enzymes that have now been cut and are functional start like a copy machine to make more and more copies of the RNA genome of the virus. The whole cell kind of like foams up and makes more RNA. And it does so by a copy machine, which is called RNA polymerase, because RNA is a polymer, and a polymerase is an enzyme that's making polymers, and an RNA polymerase is an enzyme that makes more RNA. So one way to block that process of making more RNA, which was similarly, you know, stop the infection cycle because more, if it can't produce more RNA, it's got nothing to put into new viruses is to use remdesivir, or so we thought for a long time. So this is remdesivir. Remdesivir looks to the host cell and to RNA polymerase in particular, like a nucleotide, like a building block for RNA. So it basically thinks, oh, that's new paper I can copy on, when in reality, it's kind of explosive and like blocks the entire polymerase. So you can imagine this like a Trojan horse. Remdesivir is the Trojan horse. And RNA-dependent RNA polymerase says, sure looks like RNA to me, and just builds it into the strand. So we'll have a look at this molecule. This is, by the way, I should possibly go back and explain this for a moment. This is what we get out of our measurements in cryo-electron microscopy. So this is the so-called reconstruction density, and that's what we build the molecule in. So that's like what the measurement gave us. Everything else we have to do by hand. So here is the density, and this is what the researcher built into it. The um, template strand, the old one, which is to be copied, is green. The new one is orange. Remdesivir is purple and connected to the end, although the program doesn't display it as such. What you can also see is free magnesium ions, that's the round thing, and a diphosphate. So there are more molecules that the researchers modeled in there. Um, we are around it as the protein. So I've just quickly depicted it without so you can see what's happening because it's all very crowded and difficult to see. Around it is the protein and the job of the protein is to copy the RNA and to attach one after the other, another building block to the bottom of the orange chain. It's gotten a remdesivir and it tried to put it there and it successfully did. And this structure was taken as the proof that remdesivir will stop corona. But if you look at the density, you can see that the free magnesium ions and the diphosphate have no density. They are not covered by this gray cloud, right? So we think they were never really there. And the remdesivir itself is also not having so much density. So it turns out that the structure is not quite saying what the researchers did, because the density doesn't match up with the structure they built. And as we later found out in clinical trials is that remdesivir in fact doesn't really do what people hoped, which among other things has to do with the fact that RNA polymerase from coronavirus is able to proofread, go like, oh, there's a remdesivir, then go back free nucleotides, take, rip out the remdesivir, throw it away and get the proper nucleotide to build in. So we're hoping that Molnovapir will be better which, by the way, uses a similar mechanism. It's called a nucleotide 
um, uh, uh, yeah, it's similar to a nucleotide. Um, here's another error we found in the bottom of the structure. I'm only going to show you because I think the software by Tristan Crawl is so cool. It does a real-time molecular dynamics simulation while you're dragging around your structure. We found that there is an error in the way the whole molecule was arranged. If there's any specialist, there was a nine amino acid out of register shift. Okay, I'm going to stop like geeking out. There was just an error. Let me show you how he corrects it. So first he marks up the wrong region and then he releases it and boom, it goes where it's ought to go. I wish my life would always be like this. You know, you sit with three days glasses in front of your computer, you need hours to do this by hand, but his software just does it. Sorry, it's just, if you've spent months doing this, you're totally excited by this wobbly molecule. I just wanted to show you because I think it's so cool. All right, back to uh, more general content. We have now the RNA. Let's imagine we didn't get any like good drugs so far, so the infection cycle is still ongoing. The RNA now is exported from the endoplasmatic reticulum. By the time we made this, we didn't know how, but Hamburg researchers and Dutch researchers have now found out how this actually works. There's a pore here, and the pore gets the RNA out. The RNA then gets packed into new nucleocapsid. The nucleocapsids were also coded by the genome of the virus, then gets wrapped into new double membrane, which is host membrane, just it has now spikes, which also were produced from the genome. And then over the Golgi, the Golgi apparatus is somehow involved, it gets exported. Of course, for every one that infected a cell, there will be thousands that are produced. And that's the entirety of the SARS-CoV-2 viral life cycle. <sighs> I know this was a little bit much. But I think this is cool and exciting and just about what, you know, I hope the public can understand about this. It hopefully also tells you why molecular structures are important. So they let us understand how the virus works, how host cells are infected. They can help us to find drug targets and to do structure-based drug design where we find drugs that like specifically block these big molecular machines from doing their work. They also help us to understand the structures of vaccines and antibodies. And they also let us understand changes due to, to mutations. I haven't got an example because of the time, but when we get a mutation with the structure, I can kind of tell you that bit is going to change or that bit is going to change be only by knowing the new genome. I can already make a prediction about what the mutation is going to change in the functionality. And it's really important. So in my group, we have some theories what Omicron actually does. We haven't published them. We haven't even tweeted about them yet um, because we're still waiting for research results. But it's important to understand these molecular structures. However, it's not very easy to get them. So what are the problems? When we do a measurement, we get density. In this case, the density is blue. It's from the spike head that I've shown in the beginning, right? So the top bit, you may recognize this looks a little bit like the blue density here. This is the result from our research. And in this case, I have built almost all of the molecule already. So I'm going to show it. This is like the software we're actually using at tenfold the speed I'm usually using. And I would usually be sitting there with 3D glasses. So Here's the density. I sit there with my 3D glasses and this bit hasn't been built. So you can now see me like by hand add one bit of molecule after the other, trying to get them where they ought to be. And you can quite well see that the computer is not able to do it all automatically. So I have to help it a little bit. And as I said, it's about 10 times the speed. It even got like the warning from the bin program not reacting. All of this software it's also not commercial. This has been developed by other scientists. So the usability is like so-so. Um, CUT is an amazing program, but if you want some new functionality, you better program it yourself because perhaps no one else is going to do it. And we have actually contributed with um, a plugin or two to CUT. Um, yeah, you can see it's not always easy. So I try and go like, yeah, now it's good sitting nicely in the density. And here it's fairly easy. Um, my students love doing this. 
it's like for them, it's like computer gaming. They do it for three months straight. If you don't like get them off their chair, go write up your thesis, they'll do it forever. And secretly, I'm jealous because I also like doing this. I, I don't know if you can follow, but this is like, it's like playing a game. Um, by the way, if you're interested in playing this game, we are also having like practical places and this stuff. Right, so building, 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 going like, oh, there's another alanine, I need a proline, so I mutated it, and I go like, yeah, okay, now it's all nicely sitting. So that was easy, but what do I do here? So I've built for something here, but is it correct? The density does not really tell me what's going on here. And I'm going to show it this to you in slower again, so you understand the problem, right? In this then part of the density, I can really not tell only from the density what's going on. I know approximately what the molecule must look like due to the sequence. So I've got some information. I know which atom is connected to which, but how it all three dimensionally fits in here, even if I know which lines have to go in there is super hard. So it would be very easy for me to make an error here because the measurement data don't tell me enough about what the model actually should look like. And several interpretations, several models would all be possible. Um, so this is kind of difficult. I'm just seeing a question there that I may want to answer right away. Within code, is it possible to verify if you have chosen, created the right building blocks? You know the building blocks because of the genome. So the gene tells you the order of amino acids you want to put after each other. So if you started at the right point, the rest will also be like the correct atoms and the correct connection. But how it like three dimensionally folds, you don't know. You have to make that on the density. So it is possible to do it. Um, you have to write building blocks at hand, usually. If there, however, if there is like, you know, if a magnesium ion, for example, is sitting there, the magnesium ion was not in your genomic information, you just need to know what you're doing to recognize this is a magnesium ion or this is a diphosphate or something like this. Um, right. Going to answer the rest of the questions later. Um, molecular models need to be built by hand. This can lead to errors. There are a few automatic algorithms that work under favorable circumstances, but most of the stuff still has to happen by hand. As of today, and I, I got my postdoc from like holidays for 15 minutes today, and he gave me new numbers. So we've got 1,909 molecular structures today. New structures come out every Wednesday. There are 1,334 from X-ray crystallography. That's the thing with the particle accelerator in Hamburg. Although um, they have been measured at synchrotrons all over the world, not only Hamburg, where BioNTech structures have been measured, but also at the ESRF, there have been large screens at Diamond, in Japan, in China, at Sesame, at Soleil, in America. Synchrotrons all over the world contributed to this. 35 from nuclear magnetic resonance which is a little bit of a niche method for this type of study, and 566 from electron microscopy. So 1,909 molecular structures of different states of 17 macromolecules, 17 proteins, from a total of 28. So coronavirus in total has 28 different genes for proteins. There are 28 proteins. And we only structurally know 17 of them. And then we have like different versions of them, different pH, different temperature, spike head, bit of spike head, spike head with antibody, um, things like that. So 1,900 data sets in total. Errors in structures, as we've just seen, can happen because the fit between the data and the model is bad because complete automation is not yet possible, models are built manually, expertise in many different areas is needed, you need to be good with software, you need to have done all the lab work, the measurement needs to be right, processing needs to be right, you need to know your statistical validation, you need to know your chemistry, you need to know your biology. So it's really not easy 
And you need to know your 3D goggles, unless you get sick from them, in which case you can't use them. Um, one of the major aspects is software, the methods you're using. And this is where we come in. Small structural errors can lead to big structure problems downstream. Imagine the bit with the remdesivir. The diphosphate there, the fact that there was something bound into that structure that was not really there, but the model had those like additional free magnesium ions. Down the line, as I know from insiders, led to like waste of hundreds of thousands of dollars and many hours of work time in drug discovery because they kind of like fed this model in order to find a drug that then ultimately never bound because the magnesium ion wasn't actually there. So if we make small structures that builds up hugely for the downstream applications where they need these molecular structures. Errors are common, and now we add to this an ongoing pandemic, right? And a scientist is there to rescue the day. Lockdown happens, you're sitting at home, there are no colleagues to help you, your child is homeschooling, the dog wants to be fed, your grandma calls because she's worried, and you've got to solve the spike structure on which lives will depend as fast as possible. Normally, we take a year to five to solve a structure, and in the pandemic, you only got three months. Of course, errors are going to happen. So that's, well, just a matter of fact, we've got to arrange ourselves with it. It's not the fault of individuals, it's how, how the whole thing works. It's such a complex process, errors are going to happen. Now, in normal life, my team and I are methods developers in structural biology. We are the people who give others the experimental techniques and the software to solve their structures as best as we and they can. We're not usually in the, in the stage light. We're usually, you know, for every Nobel Prize, there have been like dozens of Nobel Prize in structural biology. Has been methods developers in the background who developed the methods that made it possible to see, you know, the structure of the DNA double helix or the structure of the ribosome or the structure of the influenza virus. It's just that normally we're just enablers. However, here was a pandemic and very many structures that had errors so we did what we needed to do. We came together as a relatively large team under my leadership. We are today 23 people. We peaked at 27 last year from nine countries to check and improve the molecular structures of SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2. So we are methods developers. Most of us are methods developers. We are specialists in solving structures. We evaluate all the published structures in the protein data bank or PDB from SARS and SARS-CoV-2. We reprocess all of them and we remodel them, although not all are looked at manually because that would be just too much. We also do scientific dissemination, putting these structures into context for people who want to start doing molecular research on coronavirus, and we do public outreach. I'll give you a quick insight into our pipeline because I thought the software bit might be interesting for you. So every Wednesday come new entries of molecules in the protein data bank, which is, by the way, the worldwide protein data bank is an open, open resource. Everyone in the world can download the new structures and all the journals require people who make new structures to put them there, which is nice. I'm really privileged to be in a field where the data are public. We compare the new structures with the NCBI proteomes, so the genes from coronavirus to find the structures that belong to coronavirus, put everything into an SQL metadata base. Then we calculate how different the structures are from the ones we already know. We look whether raw measurement data are available. So we have a big problem with not all measurement data being published. Um, I hope we are going to be like astronomy one day where everything gets published. I am sitting in some German committees to that end, among others, DICOM, which is a very new hub. And then we run a number of specialized programs, which all do validation and put the results on GitHub immediately. So on Thursday, at the latest, 
researchers can find are validation, remodeling, and the quality indication for the structure, everything that can be done automatically online. We then, for some structures, manually rebuild them. So we actively look whether there are problems. That was, for example, the case with the remdesivir structure. We try to do this for those structures that we think drug designers will use the most or that are really important. And when we find errors, we contact the original authors first and tell them we found an error. Here is the corrected structure. Use our data. You don't need to cite us. Just correct your structure in the database, please. This means we won't get credit, but it meant that at the beginning of the pandemic, people were adjusting their structures already when the preprint was out. So there would not be problems downstream. And I have often been asked, I would it like do like this again. That was really like why people accepted our corrections because they didn't need to give anyone credit. They could just like change them. And the database is also online. So everyone from the Philippines to the US can just use them, whether it's like a commercial person or a taxpayer or a private person, research institution, a foundation, everyone can use our data. They're just online there for everyone. And we only ask them to give us credit in the form of a reference citation. We disseminate the data via GitHub, via Twitter, 3D BioNotes, which is a three-dimensional database, is linking directly into our um, database. We contact the authors. We also have entries in Proteopedia, uh, MOL SSI, which is a virtual bioinformatics institute, links directly into our database. So they're always like up to date showing what we are doing. We have a homepage and we do reviews. There's a lot of downstream users. The biggest ones are the EU Jedi Grand Challenge, um, Folding at Home, which peaked out uh, in July last year, I think, at 2.4 exaflops computing power for molecular simulations. And they used, in the majority, our models to start from. And uh, also very big as IBM Open Pandemics. But there are a number of others, plus many individual labs, so we found a great new many friends. Here is our homepage. That's where you can find it. There's also an English version. You can find blog posts for the public and for scientists. And in the end, I would like to talk for like five minutes about daily life in virtual mobility. So my team is over 20 people from nine different, from we, we cover nine time zones, right? We're nine hours time shift apart and we had several lockdowns so actually the majority of people in the task force about half of them don't work for me they're volunteering they're researchers elsewhere that volunteer to be a part of this effort and there are many people in the task force who've never like personally met so how do you make group coherence if you are working for 20 months or 22 months by now in an environment like this, right? We founded ourselves in March, 2020 as a chat group called the Coronavirus Structural Task Force, which was a joke back then. It didn't remain a joke, but that's how life plays. We have every day Zoom meetings at 10 o'clock, uh, one time per week in the afternoon, so the people from Oregon can join us. We do a lot of like media outreach, um, in international and German media, we've been like on Nano and Terra X and Planet E. We've been in breakfast television. That was a particularly interesting experience. My email got leaked to Querdenka and I got a few very interesting email exchanges. I also must say I never got insulted or threatened by anyone. So I just discussed with them and it worked out. Um, and I'm happy because it like I understood like how what the theories are and that was very interesting um keep the media also like to write about my hair my eyes blah 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 all these things i just want to note that streak is about my age and drosten is only nine years older than me so really okay whatever most importantly they're talking about our research we also did a lot of social media we, I got a Twitter account, everyone else did as well. 
you can watch us work on Twitch if you're interested. We found out people find it soothing to see us modeling these structures. I was requested to make stickers for the team as soon as we got a grant and we got funded by the Federal Ministry for Research and Education last uh, in 2020. We have a YouTube channel where you can, for example, see the entry animation. And the students brought a cactus, which is called Corinna de Corona cactus. I know it looked like we had fun and we did. I can tell you being car, you know, being at home, having to care for your children, having people dying, having an ongoing pandemic, knowing that IBM Open Pandemics is going to spend another million based on your research, and also that ZDF wants to talk to you and the Berliner Abendblatt. This is so stressful. Think about all the responsibility we had, and it was really terrible for us. So we needed to cheer up every here and then. The whole group kind of like grew together, and we all became friends. This was, unheard for us, it was very uncommon. As researchers, Typically, our behavior with each other is much more formal than the behavior in this group was. But these were like exceptional times. And we wanted to fight the pandemic and inform the public. That's what we were there for. And it was not so much about personal gain. And that was nice. Um, we have a group chat. You know, I mean, I'm talking to the right audience, right? We have a group chat. You know what that looks like. Let me tell you. Typically, professors don't communicate like this. Um, um, we have a we virtual have space. space. Oh, mm -hmm. we have a virtual space. We hope to change the work adventure soon. Um, we also play games in the evening occasionally with the group. So we do some team building efforts. When people can meet in person, they usually do. And sometimes they go and travel and like meet each other. But this has been very limited. And we did grow together as a network that will be there after the pandemic. So we are 25 people all over the planet that did this together. And even if we wouldn't have made any difference against the virus, I would still be happy to have done it for the friendships I made. However, we did make a dent. We don't quite know how big it is because our Science was open science, and the results could be gotten by everyone without reference. But we know a few things wouldn't have happened without us. And I'm deeply grateful for having had a purpose during this pandemic. Um, in the end, I have a little bit of a more serious topic. My work contract is going to run out in May. I think it's going to be prolonged. When it will, I'll be signing my 14th work contract since 2008. 14, like I had 13 work contracts already. Out of all my task force members, there is only one holding a permanent position and two which are retired. Everyone else including six people whose contract is going to run out next year, are on temporary contracts. And it's not students. Uh, students are extra. That the students are on time-limited contracts is OK. But Germany's got a problem. 84% of academics in German universities are on time-limited contracts. So are we. Only one task force member has a permanent position in science, and that's not me. And this is not so much on my behalf, because I'm going to find my way through life, look at all the exposure I had. But there are people out there who are single moms and dads, who come from less privileged backgrounds, or had a harder life, and who can just not afford to be on one-year contracts all the time while holding a PhD. We are losing all these bright people, and I'm seeing them, right? They leave my institute, and they go to industry, and then the universities complain that they're not competitive. We need to change the system. We need to have more permanent positions in science. I promise we won't perform worse if you give us permanent contracts. We love what we are doing. So. 
back to the corona topic. In order to understand the virus and its life cycle, we need to understand its molecular biology. This will help with the design of therapeutics. We evaluated these molecular structures with a bespoke pipeline and expert knowledge, provided context and reached out to the taxpayer and the general public to inform them. We also wrote a paper together with a long author list, making the invisible enemy visible, which is our motto. And as we started this all with questions, I'm going to end with questions. Structural biology remains difficult. What can we learn from our findings? Should as we as a com scientists community change our attitudes towards errors? Should this serve as a model for other projects? Can it serve as a model for other projects? I hadn't thought about this, but a nature editor asked me when I was writing a comment whether we believe that science should always be like this. My God, that would be awesome. I, I would totally be up for it if science would always be like this. Come together with a bunch of friends, but without funding. Start doing something to, you know, fight a global pandemic, then get some funding, still having like no senior people on a project. Can open science compete? I don't know. We get pretty little credit. Um, it would definitely. Okay. Open science compete? I don't know. It doesn't quite look like it. They're still getting measured only by the citations my paper gets. And well, at least the paper is not behind a paywall. But if we would have published all our stuff in like papers, we'd possibly get more credit. I, I really don't know, but we need to work on this. If we want open science, we need to change how people are rewarded. Um, how senior do you really need to be? I'm 39. It seems I'm called a junior group leader. All of us are young. The youngest is 24. He's writing a first author article about a coronavirus protein. I feel that the German academic system and all over the world, actually, you need to be older and older to become a professor and be permanent and be like a grant holder. I don't think it's necessary. I think that professors could be 30 and the world wouldn't, you know, like go down. Um, will what will change in science after the pandemic? We had like large exposure. It certainly will also have to do with like questions like did the virus now come from a lab or didn't it? That, you know, would change how people view science, I'm sure. How will scientists be viewed by the public, right? Um, right now, of course, you know, mom and dad are very proud, but what's gonna change? Are we going to still be the bad guys? Because we often are. Um, but I'm like, you know, exclusively taxpayer funded. I never took any money from the pharmaceutical industry. I have like, you know, no stakes in this game. I'm, I'm just like earning tax money. So I feel that there is a whole complex of difficult things there, how people regard science, but definitely the pandemic is gonna change how science is going to be viewed. What's that gonna be? <sighs> in the end, I'd like to thank all the task force members and all our collaboration partners and our scientific fairy godmother, Arwen Pearson, who had little role in this research, but much role in our mentorship and bringing us forward. My home, the University of Hamburg, the Coronavirus Structural Task Force. Our we are funded by the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft and the Federal Ministry for Research and Education. I would like to point out that we are looking for student assistance, not only for scientific work, but also for social media, video and programming work and 3D printing. So if you know anyone who's interested, please point them in my direction. My email is there. We are also offering bachelor, master and PhD thesis in areas that cover both lab work and computer work, which is a rare thing these days. Um, you can find us on YouTube and the internet and on Twitter. And I'm looking forward to the discussion. And thanks for listening. Let's just yeah, rewrite it. So <laughs> I just brought it up with the BMBF because I'm now sitting on this green on these like committees more yeah. and more. I'm, I'm reaching an age where I'm sitting on committees. And I, I told them legacy software is a problem. You know, people it's, it's are a really good problem. Like, yeah. The software is written in Fortran. 
No yes. one, every second line is go to, so it's written like assembler. No one knows what's in there anymore. And if the person dies, we're not going to be able to do anything about the algorithms. They're just going to be lost. Exactly. And, you, yeah. and they are, so you have to first influence the grant writing institutes that there are grants out so that this yeah. software can really be flourished. And this software is not easy. So that's not your typical web page. So you need to work together in large groups. And so on. it's a very interesting piece of problem, I have to say. So sadly, as a PhD student, we weren't, we weren't looking into this, but it's like, ah, this is too big of cake yeah. to eat. <laughs> But it was very interesting. So I can all, also, there's a new, new, newer, newer tool suite, and that's also only maintained by, I think, three people or so. So even that one is not written anymore in Fortran, but still not good. So um, just my <laughs> sense of that one. So there's yeah, I worked lot. in my PhD thesis, I worked on Shellix, and that faces similar problems. Yeah. It's it's really it's, it I mean, some... the software that is used in the entire world to serve every small molecule structure there is more or less. It's like, yeah. So yeah. questions, were there questions? Exactly. We have got a first question, I think, around uh, 20, 30 minutes ago. Oh, and that God. was if the, yeah, that's that's why Ladoo is so great as a signal angel. She's picking up all of these ones. Um, um, so the first question was, how do the virus variants affect the shape or the form of the virus? Ah. I think. They, so no matter like, okay, this is the old model, as we know, then there should be fewer spikes and should be a bit smaller, but nothing would change on this view. Like the scale is way too large. Um, the mutations each change about 10 atoms. So every like amino acid that is different is about 10 atoms. And those changes would be so small, you could not see them on the virus model you'd actually need to look at the head of the spike in order to see the mutation and what it actually does. So the changes are too small to show them in the model. Um, that doesn't mean they're not meaningful. So as you've seen, like the head of the spike binds to the host, to the host cell to the AC2 receptor. And that binding is highly influenced by this, by the mutations. Now we thought that we may end up lucky because the same part where the antibody is binding is also the piece that binds to the host cell. So everything that would make the spike change in a way that it, the antibody couldn't bind anymore to, it, to its head would have also changed um, how it bound to the host cell. However, it seems that Omicron is still able to bind human cells very efficiently while antibodies cannot recognize it so easily. That may have to do with like, this thing is actually like packed in, you could imagine like putting cotton wool around it and it's called glycosylation. It's got long sugar chains that like are wool and they're there to obscure the immune system. Like the antibody goes like, oh, there's wool. I can't really find where I'm ought to bind. Uh, is it here? I don't know. And that's changed in Omicron. Uh, but it's not fully understand yet. Um, I saw there was a new structure this week, but I haven't looked at it yet. Um, however, the changes are too small to show it in the virus model. They're like really tiny changes. And another change that happens in Omicron as well is the proofreading mechanism when the RNA is copied is like damaged. And we, we think it's damaged. So they're so-called endoRNAs, which is a proofreading uh, protein. Its job is like to go like, is the RNA correct? Yes, correct, correct, correct. That seems to be a little bit broken. So it could be that Omicron is accumulating so many mutations because its RNA copy machine is like not working as it should. It's basically not proofreading. That would mean that more viruses are produced that are not viable and cannot survive but it would also mean that it mutates much faster. And we think that may have an influence, but that's just theory so far. This hypothesis, we haven't proven it yet. So this is why I haven't tweeted about it yet, because it's just a theory. But it would make sense, right? Connected to that, I would have a question. The ACE receptor of small children is a little bit different than the one of the adults. Do you, do you know about that? Because Omicron is going towards more of the smaller children, but the difference is... Um, I can't, I have read that, but I haven't looked into it properly. Mm -hmm. So I'm, 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 I'm afraid I'm not going to answer this question because I feel I'd rather not say anything about it and say something that's wrong. 
Especially, well, we're looking forward to the structures, right, in the, yeah. in the public PDB so that uh, where everybody can look at them. Yeah. And, uh, and we live in an age of preprint, and very often the PDBs are there when the preprint comes out, which is how we caught so many errors, right? They published a preprint, they put out the structure, we went like, there's errors in these structures. And then when they published the actual paper, everything was corrected. I just Luckily, wish the, the, the changes, I think, are tracked on the PDB. There's a yes. second question. Yes, that's, that's what IT people like, because then, the, you know, version history is very important. <laughs> um, um, there's a second question, and it goes towards the tools that are used to simulate those molecules. Um, oh, wait, 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 wait. I have a follow-up to this. Something okay. that I would really like to see, but it hasn't happened yet. The PDB is a very static repository where only original authors are allowed to change their structures. Now, imagine if the protein data bank would be like GitHub with pull requests, where we could go like, go like, change the molecule around, go like, now it's a better fit to your data, please pull. That would be a very subversive proposition, I would say. Yeah, wouldn't that be nice? I'm yes. like, why aren't we doing this? It's like the system is already there. It happens that we have like repositories for a while in software development. We could do the same thing with models fitted to our experimental data. But um, I think I need to go into more committees. Yeah, it sounds like this. I would yeah. agree for that proposal. Yeah, um, there was a person that was asking about um, the tools that you would use to simulate those uh, molecules and structures and so on. And if you then create these um, more uh, usable pictures for the public, um, how do you balance artist impressions, simplified models, uh, while, while keeping the scientific truth as much as correct as possible? Yeah, the question doesn't, you don't need the public even to, to have this problem. You have it already when you make pictures scientifically, because sometimes you want to show our certain aspects of a molecule very clearly, which means you have to cut away, for example, a part of the molecule. So one answer to this is the program that does the modeling is not a program that you use to make the pictures. That's the first thing you do. So you make your model with one program and then you take all the coordinates of the atoms and you throw them into a professional rendering program that like, will do it all pretty. But you still have to make an executive decision on what to show in your graphics in your paper. And um, I think that in particular, as structural biologists who deal with three-dimensional and two-dimensional pictures, we do, would do very well to think a lot more about scientific illustration. So all my team likes thinking about these things, which is, I think, how we gotten where we are now. Right? They actually like stuff like this. They go like, oh, oh, we can print it 3D and then we can put a magnet on it and it's gonna stick. But it turns out that scientists also need these tools to understand what's going on. It's like actually having a 3D model helps you so much with thinking about things. Crick and Watson, they build a model of their DNA in metal for a reason. Because we're looking at three-dimensional things, making them like understandable with our hands. So Yes, as a good researcher, you're not only able to explain your research to the cleaning woman, you should also be able to visualize it properly. And it's part of the art. If you are a structural biologist and you're not able to make good pictures of your molecules, you're not a good structural biologist. End of story. You're in the wrong discipline. You should have possibly chosen something where you need less graphics. And I think one of your um, illustrators is actually a, a structural biologist by training, right? Uh, I think uh, oh, some of uh, yeah, Shanuka so Tomasello is a proper biologist. Thomas Splitschus is a proper bio, a proper yeah, like a I, PhD yeah. in bioinformatics. And yeah. it, Janet Iwasa and Anne Liu are both scientists who are having a group that only deals with illustration. So it's actually in science, we have several groups in the world in structural biology who only do illustration as science. So David Goodsell with his watercolors is very well known, but Janet Iwasa is another one. So actually making these animations and pictures is so complicated that television can't do it. And the ZDF made a series of animation. So they made very nice ones for Planet A, Wieso and Nano with us. But then they asked my expertise to make another animation 
and they only had like a call with us and they never came back and then published a completely wrong animation of the entire viral mechanism under my name. And I'm still sad every time I see it. Three times a day, Heute Journal shows a wrong structure of the virus for which they claim that I helped them make it. And I wrote to them and told them, your depiction of the virus is wrong. I can help you make a new one. But it seems that the Zweite Deutsche Fernsehen, the Heute Journal at least, didn't care. And I, I guess they think it's not important enough, but I think with a threat like this, where we really cannot see the virus, it is important to bring to the public the best possible depiction we can deliver. Sometimes, however, as I said, you omit certain aspects, for example, to show the effects of a mutation, you'd only show the site of the mutation. You don't show all the atoms. But that's really an important part of what we're doing, like that's pointing out the important bits. And that's why scientific illustration is so important. I think we have one final question, um, which I, I would say uh, comes out, comes towards the direction of um, the immune system. And uh, the question would be, can you, can you define a, a vaccine on purpose so that the immune system can forget how to produce the antibodies after a defined period of time? And I think the concern here is about um, increasing your um, your financial gain in a, in a crisis, for example. So programmed obsolescence is a, is a word that was mentioned. So um, we are a little, a little bit late, so if you could keep okay. it short, that would be great. Okay. Um, the quick answer is no, that's not possible. Um, you can make, you can enhance how long vaccines and how much immune response you get from a vaccine with certain additives but you cannot like make them a definite time because everybody is different. So even when you get your booster shot, they say six months, but you may need it after three months or you may need it after 12. Without a titter, it's very hard to tell. And the pharma industry does not have tools that would allow them that to my knowledge. So I think that's not a risk. I mean, it's, it's a human system. It's so complex. It's easier yeah. to shoot a rocket to the moon. So, but I think it's a it's a valid concern. It's just technologically yeah. not possible. Luckily, I guess. The final and really last question I think is where can somebody find the three D models? Oh, I think that's um, you can go to insidecorona.de and find a blog post about the three D thing, or you go to Thingiverse and you look for Inside Corona. Um, I can. Yeah, it, yeah. I just go to. Uh, I'll just put it in the corner.net. That's our homepage, and then on Thingiverse, it's also called Inside Corona. And um, you can also write me a message on Twitter if you don't find it at at Torn Lab. And uh, remember, we are going to put out a new model soon in January but I'm still waiting for the final files and the holiday. So it will be a few more weeks. So better print in January, not in December. And then you'll be up to date. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or print too, yes. <laughs> yeah. so so thank you very much for having me. Yeah, it was great. Thank you. And I think if there are any no more questions, everybody all right? Oh, you know how it looks like? I think that's really important. So I think one and a half years ago, I came across the first pictures. So I was like, this is how it looks like. Now I can tell it to the people who who don't read the scientific original papers because they are so difficult to read. So Yeah, all good? Yeah. And thanks for being here. And we're looking Thank forward you. to hearing and seeing more. And hopefully, once this will be over. Yeah. I think. I hope so too. Going back out of the spotlight to being just a methods developer. That would be nice. That would be nice, yes. Yeah.